Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends, to the BJJ Brick Podcast. This is episode 306, and I'm excited that we have Matt Thornton on the show today from Straight Flash Gym up in Oregon. Great guest. He's been on the show a few times before. Looking forward to hearing what he has to say. I'm on here with my buddies, Byron and Gary. How are you guys doing today? I am doing great. How about you, Byron? Doing good, Gary. Uh, excited uh, to be here. This, just so everybody kind of knows, uh, is the episode that just airs shortly after our, our big BJJ Brick event. We're actually recording it a little bit before the event, so we'll be talking about that event next episode, uh, even though this airs afterwards. But uh, really excited uh, for this episode. I had a great conversation with Matt Thornton, a lot of good insight, and, and you could uh, I think hear it in my voice as I'm learning some, some good things uh, about not just about jujitsu, but also about like running, running a gym or running a class and, and that, and that sort of thing, which I think it's important to everybody to learn because we all have certain, you know, you might think, yeah, I'm just a student or whatever, but really, uh, anybody could pick up a leadership role that, you know, you hear some things about, you know, the leader's not always the one in command of, of a situation. Oftentimes people, people lead from the back. So, um, a lot of good information from Matt Thornton this episode. You guys are going to love this. So stay tuned for the interview and uh, you will not be disappointed. And and if you haven't heard our previous interviews with Matt Thornton, uh, they the, you know go back in the archives or just type in Matt Thornton on the uh, the search uh, engine there and BJ Brick and he'll pop right up. And uh, a lot of a lot of good stuff. He's been real generous with his time and and sharing some of his uh, knowledge about jujitsu. I tried to be uh, generous with what knowledge I had <laughs> when it comes to your first year of training. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I uh, made an audio book of that, which is kind of my wheelhouse. <laughs> We're audio people here, and and so as opposed to making an ebook or an actual book, uh, sat down with the microphone, you know, had a bunch of thoughts, and and recorded an audio book about your first year of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And if that's you, if you're just starting, or you're thinking about starting, or you've been starting, you've been going for a few months now, I really hope to share some uh, things that I've learned with my journey and my, all my experience with, with interviewing and talking to, to many, many guests and, 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 and all the, the lessons I've learned from them, uh, kind of put those into an audio book and, uh, really like to get you off to that first year You're going great. And, uh, the audio book is 1199. The money goes and helps support the show. Uh, there'll be a link to the audio book in the podcast. It's about two and a half hours long and I hope it helps you out a lot. You know, Byron, I really like chapter five, uh, your training schedule. And, you know, I think that's one thing when people start, they think they can train every day. And some people may be able to, depending on their schedule and how their body adapts to it. But uh, I think uh, chapter five is a really good one. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you have a good training schedule, something that allows your body to recover, uh, allows your wife to be happy, allows you to, uh, to not miss any work, uh, I think uh, you're going to be in it for the long haul. Yeah, thanks, Gary. It's not it's not something that you think about typically is how am I going to fit this new hobby into my life? But if you don't do that successfully, you could definitely hit some road bumps that could, uh, you know, if if you're just messing up your off the mat life, that could that could have some pretty big effect on a lot of things and kind of domino effect. And we don't want to have that happen. We want jujitsu to be smoothly integrated into your life and uh, and have you continue it for many many years. And many of us, uh, you know, as we do jujitsu, we get a little bit uh, creative. I think that's that's a perfectly normal thing. We have a quote here. I don't know how to say this guy's name, Gary or Joe. How do you say? Huh. Okay, did you set me up again? No, I, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I would say Dieter F. Uchtdorf. Uchtdorf. Okay, this is from our friend Dieter. <laughs> Dieter F. Uchtdorf. Uchtdorf. Okay, I don't know anything about that person, but uh, I do have. To, I did like the quote. The desire to create is one of the deepest yearnings of the human soul. And I think with jujitsu, and you'll hear it in the interview, we talk a lot about fundamentals. But in jujitsu, we also hear a lot about creating things or, you know, working working on something and then coming up, oh, I could do this instead. And it's kind of something that you weren't really shown, but you, uh, you know, had some discovery in it to, to your own insight and something like that. And when I think about creating something, it's easy to just just to think about artwork or maybe painting. And if you want to be a good painter, you could, you know, 
get, get some paints and start painting. That's one way to try to become a good painter. Another way would be to learn about the colors, learn about how lighting and shading work and, and, the, and how different, I don't know, skin tones affect with the light and how you would, how you would paint that. Uh, learn some fundamentals. And, and then you're able to work in a deeper level of creativity because you're not breaking like fundamental laws of paint in order to try to create a painting, you, you know, I, I hand Gary paints. He can make an abstract paint <laughs> that he probably wouldn't even look that good. But uh, you know, he has some paints to Joe, and he understands how to how to mix colors. You know, he's mixing yellow and red, and making probably some kind of Hello? an orange. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and he's he's able to make something really cool. It's it's not because Gary's less creative, but because Joe understands how the basics work how mixing colors work how you know, how with the type of canvas to use and all these sort of things he's able to to be more playful and creative in that space just understanding the basics of what you're working with and i think that is very similar to jiu-jitsu byron where did you learn when you know because i know you know a lot about painting and stuff is that from when you were in college and you were making a little extra money when you used to uh go to those uh human anatomy paintings and wear your <laughs> gi and then strip naked and allow them to paint. Is that where you learned about that stuff? Because well, they... I was pretty impressed. That's when I had a better physique. <laughs> Wait, you've had a good physique? <laughs> They've since uh, recommended I stop coming by and then, you know, court orders and that sort of thing. I can't go there anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know where you are going to go with that, Gary. But... <laughs> It really, I think the person that's, that's standing there posing doesn't have to know a lot about paint. But yeah, I think you probably watched a lot, you know, yeah. when they were painting. And I've, you, want, you know, been you watched to see as the final well. product. Yeah. yeah. And also complained about what they painted was too close to real life. <laughs> <laughs> They've got no sense of perspective and measurement, right? Yeah. Or helping somebody out, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh. uh, now that that really is a great quote and i the one of the things i like about it as it relates to jujitsu is it talks about uh to create in a general sense it's not saying uh the desire to paint or the desire to do sculpture or make music or you know it's just wide open and uh you know i like that that relates to jujitsu as well no two people are going to have the same game uh, somebody's going to like playing from the top. Somebody's going to like playing loose from the top. Somebody's going to like playing tight from the top and heavy. And um, So, yeah, I, I like how this is left up to the individual. And I also like how when you think about it, uh, there are certain fundamental needs that people have to, for a good mental health. Jiu-jitsu satisfies a lot of them, and this is a good example of that. Yeah, I think maybe maybe you're, you're hitting something on that, Joe. Like the creative aspect is something that we, we all have a deep yearning for. Like what the quote says and you know you get up you know go to work go home repeat not a whole lot of creative outlet unless you're you know working in the art industry like gary and myself <laughs> <laughs> how'd i, I get in the, the art industry what was that how'd i get in the art industry like you sell the artwork and and you basically gone broke trying to sell work that i'm involved in okay i'm the broker yes breaking things something that's not broken is our off the mat lesson well, you don't know that yet. You haven't heard it. So. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> okay, our off the mat lesson this week, guys. We're going back to commercial fishing. As most of you know, I fished for quite a few years off the Oregon and Washington coast. And when I was maybe 32, I had a job running a, a small, like a 45 or 50 foot uh, wooden trawler. And we left me and just one deckhand. And we'd been out, we went over the river bar, the weather was fair, you know, five or six foot uh, chop and a little bit of wind. And um, after about a couple hours, we're both sitting in the wheelhouse just kind of shooting the breeze. And I can't remember who said it first, but it's like, does the boat feel right to you? You know, we sat for a minute and thought, man, that doesn't feel right. So I asked the deck and I said, hey, go look back in the fish hole if you would. So he goes back, looks in the fish hole, he comes up and tells me it's full of water. So we've been taking on water now for a little while. Sun's going down, it's getting dark, and we're four or five hours offshore. And it's like, oh crap. So we turn on all the pumps we have. Uh, we get the best course we can get, but uh, so that we're not going into the seas and not taking on additional water. And we start trying to get rid of the water. 
and the bilge pumps we have aren't going to keep up. And at this point, we know we're sinking. So oh, we called the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so we called the Coast Guard, and they said, you know, is it imminent? Are you in the water at this point? It's like, no, we're still in the boat. Uh, we might have an hour or two. Um, they said, okay, what are we going to do first? We're going to fly you out a pump. So th- they put a pump on an airplane and a 50 gallon drum. And it's got like 300 feet of line on it, and they drop it on one side of your boat as they fly over, and the line falls on your boat, and you can pull this up. And then uh, it's got some hoses and a can of gasoline and a gas or operates a pump, gets rid of water quick. So they send the helicopter out, <laughs> and in the meantime, we're like, you know, we got to do what we can because we don't know if we have a couple hours. We might have 20 minutes, you know. Um, so we start looking for other ways to get rid of some of the water in the boat. And in the engine room, there's a pump on the front of the engine that's uh, plumbed into what they call a sea chest valve. It's an opening on the bottom of the boat uh, where you can suck water from the sea, pumps it up onto the deck through a two-inch deck hose, use it to rinse the fish off and stuff. And So I said, let's uh, we'll shut the sea chest valve, hope it works, and we're going to cut the hose that goes between the pump and the sea chest valve, and we're just going to put that hose into the bilge and start using the deck hose to pump water out. And that worked pretty good. And actually, by the time the Coast Guard got there, I think we were at least keeping up, if not getting ahead of the uh, game. Anyway, the Coast Guard dropped us the pump, got on board, got the water pumped out, uh, went went in and figured out what was the cause of the problem initially and and got it fixed and went back to work. But a couple of lessons here that relate to jiu-jitsu, I think. And the first one is... uh, Pete and I, my deck end, we had tens of thousands of hours on boats in every imaginable condition you can have, you know, with lots of fish, no fish, lots of fuel, uh, calm weather, crappy weather. I mean, anything you can think of, we'd had thousands and thousands of hours of doing it. And that's what gave us that awareness and intuition when the boat wasn't feeling right, you know, nobody that had been fishing for a month or a year would probably have known. So... You relate that to jujitsu. How discouraging is it when you roll with somebody much more experienced than you and their awareness and intuition is just to a point where it just seems like they're reading your mind. And the way that they get there is through just hours and hours and hours of mat time. You know, so that's getting better at jujitsu. So if you're new to it and it gets discouraging when the purple belts and brown belts seem to be reading your mind, just know that that will come with the hours and hours of time. The second point I'll make, and then I'll hand it off to you guys, is when you're in a bad position and you need to escape, you need to improve your position. I kind of liken that to the, con- the, con- the position we were in just before the airplane got there. And so your first choice would have been not to have the water in the boat to begin with. Your second choice would have been to have your bilge pumps keep up. You know, you go through this checklist of what you hope will happen, and then you start going, what thinking about what you need to happen. You get down the checklist, keep looking for options, but you find something that can improve your situation. It's kind of the same thing if you're under someone's mount and you've got a, a go-to mount escape and it's not working. Sometimes it might be a good idea to keep trying, but usually, you know, if you try it two, three times, it's not working. You got to look for the next thing, and you got to look for the next thing, and you got to look for the next thing. So when you're bad position, you just got to keep problem solving until you find something that's going to help you out. Yeah, and if you're rolling with Joe or Gary, you got to get used to bailing some water because it, those guys are sweaty. <laughs> I don't know about Gary, but I'm a sweaty son of a gun. Yeah, I, I'm the same way, Joe. So uh, I guess uh, we're brothers. <laughs> that's a, that's you a know, good when, one, Joe. I noticed, though, though, Byron, when you roll with Joe and I, you know, normally you're drowning because your hose is very small. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you guys are getting after me today. <laughs> Easy target. I know, I know. Yeah. Easy target. Yep. No, Joe, I like how you brought it back to, uh, you know, jujitsu and talking about, you know, time on the mat. But I like what you were saying that uh, you and I think you said Pete, uh, Pete noticed, uh, hey, it doesn't seem like the boat is 
is running right. And uh, like you said, that's only the somebody with a ton of time. You know, a year is not going to do it. You guys had been through, you know, so many different things out there on the seas. Um, where same thing on the mats. Uh, you're not going to know in your first year, your second year. It's going to take time. And you know, you go with you're training with somebody. You know, like some of your Chantre, who's who we just trained with. Um, that's uh, you know, that's a guy who's been on the seas for a long time. He's going to notice all those little things going wrong. And um, I like how you brought uh, brought that back to ju- to jujitsu. Yeah, and so if I mean, you could even think that, think of this as a you know you're in a tournament with somebody who you don't know. And, and so it's not your normal training partners and, and you're, you're seeing them do a few things that some of your training partners do, and maybe that will help you predict what's likely to happen next, or maybe what style of grappling that they do. The easiest example would be you tie up with somebody and it feels like you're tying up with one of your better wrestlers at the gym. Okay. This person is a really good wrestler. You could tell that just from the, just from their, their stance and their, their tie up and their ability to, to just, you could just feel that. Day one, you might not have felt that, but just you've earned that and, and you're able to kind of give that quick read. And then, you know, that's just one example, but there's probably, you know, hundreds of things that you could pick up. Oh, this person grabbing my arm like this. They're probably looking for this sort of situation. They're grabbing like Tim or like Bill does, and I've got to be ready for this uh, reaction. So, you know, training with a lot of different people and paying attention while you train is also important and, and letting people do some things and working with them, not just always imposing your will. You know, you got to, <laughs> we're, we're trying to get better at this. And, and sometimes, you know, Joe goes out on really good weather days. Sometimes he goes out and the weather's a little bit more rough and, and, you know, as long as he's able to come back and, and bring most boat back with him, <laughs> hopefully he's becoming a better and better uh, person, uh, you know, not behind the wheel, um, at the mast, at the helm, I don't know, uh, on top of the water. <laughs> at, the, at the wheel. At the what, Joe? At the wheel. At the wheel. Okay. Is that yeah. starboard, Joe, or or I don't even I don't know any of these terms. I'm just trying to. Say. It's, it's it's the poop deck, Gary. Okay. <laughs> nice, Joe. <laughs> Joe well, just it gives up the poop deck until Joe went in there. <laughs> Joe uh, gives up with shoot. setting us right, and he just sends us down where he knows we want to go anyway. <laughs> yeah. Joe's making this Man, stuff up and having all his buddies listen to us. Like, listen to these two guys. <laughs> Man, Byron, you summed that up well. I couldn't have said it better myself. That's you mean that's about the you whole just point giving up on explaining ex- Mariner terms and just calling it the poop deck? That no, sum up <laughs> explaining that whole deal about being intuitive on the mat. So. Uh, <laughs> well, thanks, Joe, and I you know always appreciate you you sharing some stories, and I think we could all everybody has their own stories, and if you could just kind of look into how is this affecting my life, and then take that and how well how could this relate to Jusu? Or how could this just lesson learn? I've learned, you know, take that off the mat and, and affect my life in a better, real positive way. So uh, it's kind of you know, a one thing, good thing. I think, you know, what you've done in life, uh, you know, just being out there, you know, as a commercial fisherman there and stuff like that. You've probably ran into situations like that before, which is very stressful situation where you have to, you know, think quickly, have a calm head. Um, you know, just your experience experiences there have probably helped you when you first started jujitsu and even today, um, you know, cause jujitsu, you've always got to think quickly, have a calm head. But, uh, you know, when you were telling this story, I was, uh, I was getting scared. I was like that, that would be a, uh, a scary situation to be in, uh, you know, especially for a first timer, but you know, even somebody like yourself, who's been out there, you know, many times. And like you said, you're four or five hours away from shore and uh, you're just sitting there on the poop deck, uh, you know, not knowing <laughs> what's going on. Yeah, you don't want Figuring to be sitting there, guys. Let's, uh, without any further ado, let's get our interview with Matt Thornton on. Here we go. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. His rear naked choke is so potent that opponents have been known to disrobe upon contact. When he was a kid, he would always compete in the adult division. Now that he is an adult, he is considering making a run at the kids' title. He signed up for a sumo wrestling match. The group Salt and Pepper showed up without warning to sing their song, Push It. He not only pushed it, he pushed it real good. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick Podcast. Hey, sweaty, my friends. 
All right, my friends, I'm happy to bring Matt Thornton back to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Matt, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been it's been a little while. You've been, I guess, a couple of times, and you're definitely a, a listener favorite. Um, I don't know wow. when it, it happened, but I, I finally got the chance to meet you. You came and you and you gave a talk about self defense, but and, and that was a lot of fun and and uh, I learned a lot. And I really enjoyed uh, your the time you had here in Wichita. Yeah, no, that was a good time. Thank you for for coming to that. So if uh, we, we Matt, we do you're, you're fairly well known in jiu-jitsu, but we do get a lot of people who are fairly new to to this and, and may not have heard of you uh, in in your organization. Uh, can you just kind of give us a quick uh, overview of of who you are, a little bit of your history, and a little bit about SBG? Sure. I started training in the '80s. I first um, saw the existence of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in the very, very late 80s and ran into it in the early 90s when I was a Jeet Kune Do instructor and uh, ran across Fabio Santos and then Hickson Gracie. Um, I was completely um, in, enthralled and fascinated by Jiu-Jitsu. I received my blue belt from Hickson and then went on to train with Chris Howder, who gave me my purple, brown, and black. And um, I started my own school in the early 90s here in Portland, Oregon, which is called SBG, or uh, Great Blast Gym. And we've since become an uh, international organization. We have over, uh, I think at this point, we're around 75 locations around the world. Uh, I have 25 of my own black belts that I've given out, one of which uh, is John Cavanaugh, who's fairly well known for being the coach of Conor McGregor. But all of my black belts and coaches have been pretty accomplished. Um, and, uh, yeah. And I love to spread good word about jujitsu cause I think it's good for people. Yeah. That, that's uh, awesome. And I, and I've had the, the fortunate, uh, chance to interview several of your coaches and, and just to compliment everybody who I've uh, been able to contact and, and, and reach out to have been super professional and it been nothing but, uh, uh, great to work with. So, uh, right. that's, that's really that doesn't always happen, and that's no. That doesn't even mean the people are, are like a, a bad thing. It's just like when I get a hold of an SBG coach and start chatting about, you know, doing an interview, they're always really uh, professional, and I and I definitely appreciate that just from the podcasting side of things. Good, good. Um, that's that's what I like to hear. So seventy five locations. That sounds uh, uh, like a lot. How does one? Uh, deal with that sort of thing or or do you have people uh, obviously that probably help you kind of run run the show behind the scenes oh absolutely so you know it's a company um and then my my right hand man is my first black belt from portland which i think you i don't know if you've had him on the show or not travis davison not yet and uh okay yeah he's definitely somebody you want to talk to but he uh he helps me run the whole organization as a whole, but keep in mind it, it, these aren't, I don't mean to, to say like, these are my gyms in which I own them all outright. These yeah. are my black belts and coaches who've gone on to, uh, and have had their own, have their own black belts and coaches at this stage. Um, and that's kind of how the organization grown, uh, almost all of our growth. We, we've had a few people who've come to us as black belts. Um, and, but that happens very rarely. And, and, when they come in and meet the organization, they, they just uh, vibe well with uh, our values and and they become part of the group. But by and large, almost everybody that's running at SBG now is a student of one of my original students. And that's kind of how it spreads. So, for example, I, I'm not even sure off the top of my head, but I think there's probably about a dozen locations in Ireland. Um, and all those are students in one way or another of John Cavanaugh. And we have some locations in the UK, and those are all students of um, Carl Tanswell, who was my uh, third black belt. So that's kind of how it grows. Yeah, that, that's that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. to, to see that, and uh, it, it, a lot of that is just like I, I, I guess I don't know, but it seems like you know producing quality black belts that are um, you know driven to to help promote other people with jujitsu and, and they want, they eventually will branch off and do their own thing, uh, with support yeah. with you. Absolutely. I think it's really important to, and I've stressed this with my black belts, just, um, you know, this job and the organization is something that I've learned from doing because when I started, we were the, I was the first Brazilian jujitsu MMA slash MMA school, really, I think in the state, certainly in Portland. And when I started, there was 
no other schools or anybody really does. There was no such thing really as an MMA coach. So there's nothing to model yourself after. And, and I made a ton of mistakes, uh, no doubt about it. But one of the things I've learned over the years is that it's important to create a route um, for your instructors who may want to go on and teach. Because if you don't do that, if you don't, I don't just mean teach within your gym. That's It's important to have a route for them too so you, they can learn how to teach because that's different from being able to how you do, how to do jujitsu. But some people are going to come through and they're going to train with you for a long time and then they're going to want to open up a school. They're going to see like, hey, this is something I would love to be able to do. I would love to be able to do what I love and make a living at it. And if you're smart, you're going to want to create a route they can do that and they can come to you and they feel open coming to you and asking about it. And you can help them accomplish that goal rather than have them uh, have it turn into uh, an antagonistic thing where they eventually run off and become competition because there was no um, road paved for them about how to do that. So in SBG, we have, we have a definite uh, route for our coaches to take if they do decide they want to open up the school. And one of the things we do is we actually help them do it. That, that's interesting. So it, it, we make a comparison a lot on the uh, the podcast here that uh, you know just because you could you could do jujitsu and perform at a, at a very high level doesn't mean you could teach at really any exactly. level because they're two different right. skills. It, they're, they're complementary, but sometimes they're complementary. Sometimes I think that people who pick it up really easy and are really athletic have a harder time teaching because uh, it was easy for them and they can't see how someone like me is struggling to figure this out. It's easy to just do it the right way. It's like, well, I don't know. Exactly. So it, 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 a different level or a different angle would be, uh, you know, not only just know how to teach, but the skill of, of running a successful academy. Absolutely. So, we have, um, just to speak to that, just yesterday, I think, the, by I don't even know at this point which class it is, but I think it was the 12th class or somewhere in there. We, we've had probably close to 10, uh, 10 years we've been doing this instructor training program. So one of my black belts here at, at my gym coaches a dozen or so people once a year just in how to be a coach. And they have to graduate for that program, and then they go on to – shadow and be an assistant for one of my other coaches that's on the staff before they're ever allowed to teach a class. And all my staff goes through, through that training. Um, and it's pretty extensive and they get tested and we want to make sure they understand how to present material in a way that's logical and fun for the students and professional and, and on and on it goes. And you can't assume that because somebody can perform jujitsu that they can pass it on. And like you said, my experience over the last 30 years has been the same. Some of the worst coaches are world champions um, just because a lot of them maybe haven't had to sit down ever and think about why something works or articulate why something works because sometimes some of those things come for the, come to them fairly naturally or they, they learn in a very physical way and it's hard to articulate that sometimes if people, uh, especially if that's not their personality. So you have to teach them how to teach separately and running a business is a whole other thing as well. And there's young black belts that will think that, well, if I'm, if I'm getting gold medals and I'm competing and, or I beat this such and such world champion, I'm going to come in and open up a school. I'm going to make, I'm going to do well and make money. And that's not how it works. So you have to respect the, the business aspect of, of running a good gym as a separate uh, piece, uh, a separate area of, of knowledge that you have to learn on its own. You have to learn all the operating procedures and um, the front end and the back end and how you sign people up and how you keep them in the gym once you sign them up and, and so forth and so on. Otherwise, it's just not going to work well. Yeah, so you're really having to to stack up those talents as far as be able to do jujitsu good enough to you know perform on the mats with your with with your students or whatever. Be able to coach and and teach jujitsu, and then also another skill would be uh, you know be able to run a business that doesn't go under before it uh, gets its feet on the ground. Absolutely. So with all the business owners, they're part of it in SBG. They're actually part of a business group that meets early. We have phone calls. And then you'll, you'll see, or people may that follow the organization might see that we have these uh, semi-yearly camps, so uh, twice a year at least, and then usually overseas as well, um, where the students get together and all train. But what they may not know is the day before the camps, on Friday all day from usually starting at 9 in the morning till 5 or 6 in the evening, there's a business meeting where all the gym owners get together, and they're in a conference room. And we're going over business with them. We're going over marketing things that work, and we're going over uh, retention ideas that have worked, and we're sharing that information 
um, among ourselves. And the great thing is in the gym right now, there's, there's, you know, probably at least a dozen gyms or close to it that have more than 500 students, um, at their location. And so we have some, we have some big, uh, million dollar a year schools, um, uh, that can help that have gone through the entire process of starting to teach in a garage. And now they have, you know, seven or 800 students and we can help bring the young black belts up through that process and they can accomplish the same thing if that's what they want to do. You mentioned uh, marketing uh, a gym, and I'm just I'm curious because I think a lot of people uh, that that train after a few years, they think, man, I wonder. They kind of get that just curiosity. I wonder what it would be like to do this as as a career because this is really fun. Right. I'd like to do something that's fun with my career. But what are some uh, either common uh, good or bad marketing practices that you see in the jujitsu world? Oh, that's a good question. Um, let me attack that question from, from a different angle. I think the most important thing as far as running a successful gym, and we and I would define success um, a lot more broadly than just financial success. Financial success is one piece of that metric. If you're providing a, a service that people like, then you will, you know, in a, in a free market system, you should be successful. But we also want it to be healthy for people, and, and what we want it, we want what we do. Um, to have a level of integrity to it. So one thing I always explain to my coaches and the people that are, are training with us in the business group is that if I became a billionaire tomorrow, if all of a sudden I inherited $4 billion and I didn't need to make a single dollar from my gym to live off of or to support my family, there's not a single business practice I would change because every single operating procedure we have from how the phone calls are handled and how the front desk people greet people when they come in to how my coaches teach to how much I charge every single piece of it. I would do anyway, because it's produced a better culture. And I think the single most important thing about running a successful gym and, and an organization is that you have a healthy culture that um, is authentic and that, that speaks to who you are and what your values are. And so all, all of the SBG schools share a certain set of values, which is why I, I think you, as you've experienced, when you talk to them, you're going to get people who are nice, they're kind, they're professional. Those, those are a given. Those, you're not going to make it in this organization if you don't have that. But they're all also all a little bit different. And so I, I try, and this is where it gets back to the marketing, I try and make sure that I don't want one of my black belts who runs a gym to do some form of marketing that doesn't speak to who they actually are. You want the marketing to reflect your values and who you actually are in your area. And there's nothing you have to do that's cheesy or goofy or, you know, you don't, I, I, so to, to speak directly to your question, I think taking other people's marketing ideas and just taking the video and the personality of that person and all that, and trying to throw that out there into the marketplace is a bad idea. You may get some small short-term gains, but they, they won't. You won't have good retention, and it won't speak to who you are. You're not going to. You're not going to build a room that, in a five years later, you look around, and you want to be with every single person on that mat. You're in a room where you like everybody there, right? Which is where I want my coaches to be. That's where I'm at when I'm at my gym. To do that, the marketing has to speak to who you are, but. Having said that, there are universal principles of marketing and things that are constantly changing as it relates to, for example, Google AdWords and Facebook and operating procedures and things that you need to know about how to design campaigns and so you can save yourself money and, and, and get a good ROI. And that's the stuff that we try and pass on. But I still think it's very, very important that um, the message that you're putting out to people is a reflection of who you are and the values that you hold. Uh, the details about, you know, how you run a good ad campaign or, or how, uh, how you can get students from Instagram or those kind of things. Those are, those are the kinds of things that we share with each other at the business group. Okay. That, that makes sense. Um, so as, as these students come in and, and it definitely depends on, you know, the marketing that that's been out there to bring in students, yeah. why are, why, like when somebody shows up at your gym, uh, what brings them there? Is it jujitsu? Is it self-defense? Are they wanting to lose weight? I know it's, it's everything, but is there one that's right. a bigger slice of that pie than, than the others? Sure. So we, we, um, we interview everybody that comes into the school 
we find out what they're really interested in. Um, and that's a process. <clears throat> they talk to a consultant that, that spends some time with them to make sure that, uh, we know what their goals are and we try and set them up in a program that's actually going to help them meet those goals. So I have pretty good data on that. And honestly, the majority of people that come to our gym are coming for what they will say is self-defense and or get in shape with something that's not boring. And it's usually some variation of that theme by which most of them mean they want to do something athletic. Um, they want to gain confidence and they want to be in a community. They want to be around other human beings. And one of the great benefits of jujitsu, as, as you know, is it's social. Even just the physical contact of rolling with people is so healthy for people, especially in today's day and age where so many people are on phones and um, on screens. They, even their job, they might be on a screen all day. And, and, and I think that that can oftentimes, you know, lead people into depression. And then they don't even wind up knowing their neighbors. But if they come to a school like ours, all of a sudden they're becoming part of a community. They're having physical contact with other people. They're getting in shape and over time they're getting confidence. So they're, they're able, I know when they come at the door, whether they know it or not, that those are all the benefits they'll get from it. And our job when they come in is to try and explain that to them. So they understand that. <clears throat> but and subconsciously, I think that that's what the vast majority of students come in want. But they will phrase that as usually, and to be honest, I think the number one way they phrase it is self-defense. Um, maybe they, they, they've been talking about wanting to learn self-defense. And by that, I think most of them mean more confidence. And some friends have said, well, you should try jujitsu because, you know, Taekwondo is not the same thing. And a lot of people watch MMA now and and they'll get steered towards jujitsu and they'll do a search online for jujitsu, but because someone told them about it, but when they walk in or when we talk to them on the phone, they'll tell us, yeah, I want to do jujitsu, but really it's self-defense. Almost no one signs up because they want to compete in jujitsu. Competition is something that they think about after they've done it for a while. And they're like, wow, I could actually, I could do that. And then they'll, they'll go on to compete. But most people that walk in the gym, I think, um, uh, I think it's some variation of self-defense. So, I mean, just from the, like a different angle on that. So if you get a new student in there and, and they're kind of on the fence, whether Jesus is right for them or not yeah. uh, pushing like this school talking about, Hey, this guy's got a, you know, a bunch of medals doing this competition and this, you know, the team is real strong and we compete a lot versus uh, some of the other benefits as far as like, yeah, you know, within a little while you'll learn some fundamentals and, and, and be able to perform better in a self-defense situation. It, it might be a, uh, like a better selling point for jujitsu when somebody who's kind of uh, has their, their toe in the pool or so to speak. Uh, it's a hundred percent better selling point. So most of the people that are going to come into your gym aren't going to come in because they want to compete. And when they see a bunch of young athletic people, male or female on the wall and pictures with them with their hands up in the air and they're all, they're in shape, you know, and they're, they're athletes and you have all the medals hanging up on the wall if that's the first thing they see and if that's if that's what fill, your lobby is filled with and if that's the marketing you put out there, for the people who've already trained jiu-jitsu and are looking for a credible jiu-jitsu gym, that lends um, some gravitas to your school for okay. sure. Um, and it shows that, that your coaches can help them learn the fundamentals well enough for them to go and win in competitions. Absolutely. But for a good percentage of people when they walk in, if that's the message that they're getting, it's very intimidating. And, and you'll find that, you know, a lot of people are going to walk away that would have otherwise benefited. In fact, I would put it this way. The people who need jujitsu the most will often be uh, frightened by that and walk away and won't sign up. So when so what we want to do, what we do at my gym and my lobby, when they, the first thing they see when they come in is lots of pictures of smiling faces and people who look just like them doing this activity so that they come in and see, wow, these are people like me. They're not all 22 year old, you know, stud athletes. Um, they look like normal everyday people, men, women, middle age, and they're having a great time. And then as they, they walk in more into the gym, of course, they'll see, you know, all the medals and they'll see the championship belts and they'll see, you know, IBJJF medals hanging up and things like that. But that's not the, the first and main message that we put out because that's not the majority of my student base. I have a lot of people who compete. I have a lot of people who compete well, but the majority of my students don't compete and the majority of my students will never compete. 
because most people who do jujitsu don't compete. You know, if you get 20 or 30% of your gym competing or, or competing a few times in their life over the course of their jujitsu career, that's, that's pretty good. You know, in a gym like mine, we have five or 600 students, you know, that's, that's a hundred students maybe that attend a tournament or 80 students that, that will sign up for a tournament. That's great. And I recommend it to everybody because I think it's usually a really positive experience for people to compete in jujitsu, but don't forget about the other, you know, 400 students, the other 70 or 80% of your gym that, that they're getting all these massive benefits from the community and from the activity. Um, but they're not necessarily inclined to go sign up and compete in the Pan Ams. And I'll, I'll tell you something else just to, to bring home the point. My yeah. office here in my, in, in my gym, I have a window by my desk and I can kind of see out into the lobby um, and people can't see into my office. And over the years, especially years ago when I was, when we were, when I was first building up the gym and I was, I was here, you know, all day, every day, long hours, I would, I've seen so many people walk up to my front door of my school because my windows in the front door are glass, walk up, reach for the handle and then turn around and walk away. You know, that would happen multiple times a week um, as people came up. And those are people who who want to do this, who need to do this, but are scared. And they're so scared that they'll make it to the gym and they'll get they'll drive to the gym and they'll go they'll walk up to the door and then they'll turn around. And if, if I hadn't seen it for myself, because I've had other people, mentors and things who've told me this, but if I hadn't seen it for myself, I don't think I'd believe it because after doing this for so long, just like you've done this for so long, it's such a comfortable place for me to be. But for somebody who's 34 or 35 and is working at a desk job or 40 working at a desk job and has never done anything athletic and they want to learn self-defense to begin with, because maybe they were picked on when they were younger or they're not, you know, they're not uh, somebody who's uh, that confident to begin with in their daily life, by which I mean the people who need jujitsu the most, the people who I want to teach the most, it's scary to walk into a school and sign up, even though all my students are nice and my coaches are great and I know they're safe. It's scary. So I guess that's my long winded way of saying you, you want to make that onboarding process as friendly as possible. You don't want the gym to be a scary place for new people to walk into because you're going to lose a lot of people that we can help. Yeah. That that's, that's interesting. What, yeah, if you have any idea, do you think they're they're afraid? Are they afraid of physical harm? Are they afraid of being embarrassed? Are they afraid of not being good at something? I think it's you being embarrassed. I mean, I think most MMA coaches have had the experience. If you if you spend enough time around the sport, you realize that what young men are most afraid of before the fight happens, before they go into the cage, isn't necessarily getting beat up. I mean, if they're on a fight team and they're training, they're getting beat up, right? You're, you're tapping out, you're getting hit in the head. They, they do that. They show up to practice and they do that. So what they're, what, what they're afraid of or what fear is not even necessarily the right word, but where the anxiety comes from before the fight is being embarrassed in front of their friends and family. That's what everybody worries about. And for the average person who's not a professional fighter, amateur fighter, it's the same in many ways. It might, you know, it might take a different form in their mind, but they're afraid of being embarrassed or being humiliated. And if they're going into a place where they're, they're going in and in their mind, everybody else is already going to be much better than them. And maybe they even visualize that there's going to be some people on the mat that were, you know, like the bullies that gave them a hard time when they were in school. And are they going to be able to be calm and go through the class and filled with a room of people like that? Because that's what they think the gym might be like and then when they walk up all they see are pictures of uh and and medals from competitive animals that are awesome yeah they're going to turn around and walk away and when they realize wow instead you get them to come into the gym and they spend a week or two they're like wow these are people just like me who i would enjoy hanging out with after class is over then they're going to stay they're going to stay with you they're going to sign up they're going to be part of the community and a lot of times they're going to go on to become great coaches and great competitors. Yeah. And, and just another kind of example of 
how to get this new person kind of folded in. You know, if as a coach, you got a new person first day on the mat, do you partner them up with one of the more friendly people that may not be super great at jiu or like a new pearl belt who's just smashing everybody that they roll with? The answer is pretty easy. You, you partner with the friendly person and make sure they have a good experience their first class, and, and they'll learn. Absolutely you know, the levels later on. You mentioned like schools of 500 students and, and that's really hard for me to, uh, you know, comprehend how, how that really works out. You know, what is a, like a healthy range or percent for uh, a school? Like as far as like percent of kids versus adults, you know, women on the mat. And I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer to this, but if you had a school right. with 500 students or a hundred students and there was no women, like, okay, something happens yeah. here where it pushes all the women out the door that even show up. Exactly. So yeah. like what's a good range or any idea of like what, what a good uh, mix would be? Yeah, I think, um, well, first you have to have a good kids program. Not, not all the gyms are, are teaching children, but if you have a good kids program, then, and you're, and you're, you're really trying to teach kids at the same level as you're trying to teach adults. You should have a fairly equal balance between kids and adults. You may have, you may wind up with more kids than adults. You may wind up with uh, slightly more adults than you have kids, but you're still going to have a lot of kids. Um, if you're running a healthy kids program, uh, you know, 40 to 50% of your match should probably be kids. And then with the adults, I'd say minimum 30% women, Closer to forty percent women is a then you're then you're really running a good program. If you're looking around and it's eighty ninety percent men and there's only ten twenty percent women, you're probably not running a great program. Or you might have a great program, but you're not um, you're not getting that message out to people, and so it's too intimidating, or or the the facilities aren't up to standard, or whatever it may be for the for women to stick around. So I think on a good healthy mat, if you're just talking about adults. In jiu-jitsu now, I think 40% of that mat at least should be should be female. Women love jiu-jitsu. I've talked about this before on your show, but I think they learn jiu-jitsu better than men do. They're better students generally. Um, and I think women, once they experience it, try and get over some, some – for some women, like the idea of rolling, especially rolling with men right away, might be intimidating for and, and hard for a number of really valid reasons. But I think once – women experience it, they're just as likely to fall in love with jujitsu as men are. So in a good, healthy location where everybody, we have a great culture and everybody is rolling and training the way they should be. I think you should have about 40% uh, minimum women on the mat. And, and you kind of alluded to different you know, reasons why that number might be lower than it should be as far as uh, you know, the culture of the, of the gym, uh, it, it, it might be the marketing, maybe you're advertising at places where, uh, women are a little less, you know, if you're advertising at, uh, I don't know, a men's gym or something at a, at a weightlifting place, I don't know. Uh, maybe you're kind of right. reaching the wrong market on that. Uh, and you mentioned facilities and, and I hadn't thought about that, you know, recently though, I interviewed somebody and she said that they, they were using the women's, uh, restroom, which they had a women's restroom, which is a pretty nice thing to have. If you don't have that, you know, that, that that's a step back, but they were, they were letting the, just everybody use that also as a storage place. So like guys would come in, knock on the door, and then go in and get their key or some of their equipment out of right. that. She's like, that's a negative. And the owner didn't even realize yeah. that, that that was a turnoff for uh, getting people to say, this is a place for me, because uh, it was kind of like a un- – they, they didn't realize that just the facility itself was putting a barrier there. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, that would be a, that would definitely be a classic scenario that's – you know, if I was a woman and I was I was uh, a little bit intimidated to start this um, to start this kind of program, and the bathroom is a place where guys are constantly knocking on the door, and you're thinking to yourself, maybe you're using the bathroom, you're gonna have a bunch of guys knocking on the door to get their stuff. I probably wouldn't sign up either. So it's really important that you kind of um, think about all of that. Think about what people see when they walk into your gym. Is it clean? Are the bathrooms clean? Do you have a separate locker room for women? Uh, is it is it a place where everybody's going to feel and comfortable? Um, and that's super important. Um, but if you have all that stuff nailed down and, and you and you have a good facilities and, and a good culture, you know, I think I think uh, you can easily get forty or, or more percent of your gym to be female. Yeah, I think sometimes. You know, it, I don't, know, I don't know what the answer to this is, but sometimes people have an interest in self-defense. And it seems like guys always think, yeah, I want to learn how to fight. Women always think, I need to be able to defend myself in a situation. And so it, it right. like the desire 
just the outside of to do a combat sport, it might be a little less for women or, or maybe it's not, but there's an interest there for women that I think they have like that interest, how to defend myself, how do I do that? And so they're looking for it where it might just break at 40%, like people, like 40% of, of women are interested in something like this versus, uh, you know, the percent of men. So there might it never be 50, 50, uh, you know, in on an average in jujitsu altogether. Right, it could be, uh, but I think once you get enough women in the program too, then the other benefits that and these, by the way, I think are are the reasons why people stick around in a school. The reason why they stick around in a school because once you get your blue belt, you you know you can defend yourself in a lot of situations if you stick around that long. For people who who stay with jujitsu enough to eventually become a black belt, the community is really important to them. They've made friends there. Um, it's where it's the place where they go and get rid of help relieve the stress that they get from work and their daily life. But they really, they make connections with the other members of the, of the community. And that's what keeps them coming to the gym. So if you have enough women in your school to begin with, then when, and, and you know, you have a friendly culture that a healthy culture, then women are going to come in and, and a lot of them are going to become part of that community and, and make friends with the other women on the, and just like the men do when they come and train with the men and, and make friends with the men in the gym as well. And that's, what's going to keep people coming back and staying with you. Yeah. I, I'd be interested in, in knowing your, your views on uh, having a, a women's only class versus having a class that is perfectly geared and comfortable for women to, to be in like, um, what are your thoughts on that? Women's only class is vital. If you want to have okay. plenty of women in your gym, you need to have a women's only class. Um, and and the reason is really simple. Do I want women to train with men too? Of course. If you're if women are going to learn self defense and be able to learn jujitsu, I want them. Ultimately, and I I can I'm a father of two daughters, so I can think of this in terms of my daughters. I want them ultimately to have the experience of rolling with men, so that they know what that's like and they can defend themselves. And also um, so that they can make their jujitsu versus jujitsu game work against bigger, stronger people. It's going to be beneficial for them. It's only going to help them. But for a lot of women, that's very, very intimidating for a lot of good reasons. They might, they might have had very negative experiences in the past. They might have uh, been victims of, of uh, physical or sexual abuse. There's all kinds of reasons why it can be very intimidating to train with guys. They might not want to get hurt. You know, there's there's women that may have gone to a previous school that didn't have a good culture and wound up getting injured. And so for all those reasons and more, having a women's only class where they can come and train and feel comfortable and train with other women um, is great. And then many of them, in fact, I'd probably say that the majority of them wind up joining co-ed classes and training with men anyway, which is perfect. And also, you know, I don't want to I don't want to put aside the fact that it's probably just well, not just probably, it's fun, I think, for women to be able to come and roll with other women because now they're rolling with people, their same weight class and, and similar attributes, and they get to have play jujitsu. And generally, I think women have a healthier attitude towards jujitsu. It's more playful, and uh, they're, they're not so concerned about tapping. So they're going to have usually, I mean, I'm painting with a broad brush, of course, but often they're not as concerned about tapping as the men are. So they have a, they wind up having more fun. So for all those reasons and more, I really think you need a women's only class. And, and when you start one, if, if you're a coach who's hearing me say that you don't have one now, it's super important that whoever's running that class is somebody who wants to have a lot more women train at the gym and is on board with your goal. And that's a lot more, a lot more important than whether or not they're female, because if you have, when people first start, if they haven't had good classes before, they may have some women that have trained at that gym for a long time. And those women are used to training with men and occasionally not always, but occasionally some of them will have an attitude of, well, why does she need a women's only class? I didn't need a women's only class. I trained with men. Why does she train? And that attitude can carry over into that. It can infect the culture and they can be the worst advocates for (laughs) getting more women in the gym. Uh, So, Having, you know, a woman who really shares the goal or a, or a man who really shares the goal of getting women in, into your gym because it's healthy for women to do jujitsu is super important. Yeah, that's interesting. It reminds me of the example of, you know, the new student training with the, 
the more enjoyable person versus the better uh, jujitsu practitioner. Uh, have the right student, have the right person teaching the women's only class. May or may not be female. You know, I think it is an advantage if it is, but she also needs Absolutely. to fill the role of being, uh, you know, able to do it successfully and, and not hold any yeah. sort of a, a negative attitude towards things. Absolutely. Yeah, hundred percent. So I got you here. I got a whole list of topics that I uh, hope to cover uh, many more of them. But I do want to ask you um, uh, about uh, teaching seminars. You've taught countless seminars. And, and it, you know, just like in Jiu-Jitsu, the, the more you roll, the, the more experience you get and you learn from those things. Um, any advice for somebody who's going to be teaching seminars? Yeah, um, sure. Uh, you want the students to have fun. I mean, the first thing is, when I'm teaching, the most um, single most important thing is that you're present on the mat. You know, you got to put your phone away, put everything, all your distractions away. You don't want to be sitting there talking to an, uh, to the instructor or the owner of the gym the whole time. You want to give as all your attention to the students who are looking at you taking your class. That's number one. Uh, number two, you want it, you want it to be a pleasant, enjoyable experience. So, you know. You want to help them. You want to be friendly. You don't want to be, uh, you don't want to use sarcasm or ridicule or all that kind of stuff needs to go out the window. You have to be mature and friendly and and present with students. And if you can do that, then you can teach a good class. And then after that, I think the biggest mistake I see from coaches who teach seminars is they teach too much material. Uh, And they'll just, they have it, oftentimes they come from good places, but they're thinking, oh, I want to show them something new, quote unquote. I want to show them a bunch of stuff. It's like they're they're trying to give them more, but the net result is the students, especially the ones who haven't done jujitsu for a long time, who might be newer students, walk away from that feeling overwhelmed. And because they feel overwhelmed, the, the seminar itself might take on a negative connotation because it makes them feel bad about themselves and their ability to do jujitsu. Which brings me full circle back to number one and being present with the students. Because if you're present with the students, you can kind of see how they react to the material and you can slow it down and say, okay, the majority of the room is not really getting the information that I've shown so far. They're not able to do it or they're not fully understanding. And then, you know, spend more time on that and spend a, spend the rest of the seminar making that good instead of sugar throwing out a bunch more information. Um, and I think sometimes coaches who are younger coaches who haven't taught that many classes don't realize how little information you have to teach in order to have a great class. You know, people oftentimes don't, don't want a lot of stuff thrown at them. There's just a couple things that when they leave that class, they're actually better. They feel they can recognize the fact that they've gotten better then they'll come back. They're going to say good things about your course. They're going to say good things about the seminar, and they're going to want to come train again. Those are, those are all uh, great points. Uh, that, that I mean, I ask you this, yeah, because you taught a lot of seminars, but also you're uh, help guiding uh, many, many black belts who are out there teaching seminars as well, and you obviously want to help them do the best they can. So uh, without teaching you know, a two-hour seminar that shows you know, 50 techniques, um, Percent wise, or we, I mean, we talked about those ratios of kids versus, you know, adults and that sort of thing. It just, just a guess of, of your seminar is most of the time spent with, you know, student and student, you know, drilling the techniques. Are you spending quite a bit of time talking about the techniques and talking about the, like the why behind the techniques? Or are you, um, you know, spending time uh, doing some uh, situational sparring? Like what kind of, uh, in like I guess time investment are people getting uh if you had to break that like into a pie chart like where are people spending yeah. their time so the mass majority of the time should be spent the students should be spending with each other working on the material um i i, I don't want to talk too much uh you may think you're real interesting i i may think <laughs> i'm super interesting but the students usually don't think that it's that interesting and, and again, that often comes from a good place of like wanting to articulate the process you went through and finding this material or wanting to articulate all the, how the material works. But usually after you've talked for more than about two minutes, when people are there ready to take the class, a lot of people just start tuning you out. I mean, there's always going to be one or two who are going to just be into it and they'll come and tell you they're into it. But Again, you got to be present with the whole, with the group as a whole, almost as if that's an entity. And you will see that the majority of people 
you know, they're starting to look up at the ceiling or they're, you know, they're, you're not keeping their attention. So I don't think you should talk that much. Um, although it is important to articulate what you're doing, you want to do it in as an efficient a way as possible. And you want to let them work the material and then, you know, go around and, and spend time with each person. If possible, if it's, if it's, if it's a small enough seminar, you know, go with each pair of people who are doing it and give them personal one-on-one advice and help as they're training with their partner. That's super useful. Um, that's really, I think what people want, that's their connection to you as an instructor. And, and that's your chance to work with them right there, um, at the event and help them personally. So the more you can do that, just have them working with each other and then walk around and help them, the better, the less you just stand in front and lecture, you know, all of, all of them as a whole, or, just continually demonstrate more and more and more stuff without giving them time to work on it, the better your class will be. So that's kind of the, the upper level or, or, you know, how to give a seminar. Uh, Any advice you have for students just taking seminars? I think basically, I don't know, most students, if not all at some point or another, go to a jujitsu seminar and try to pick up some stuff. Any, anything other than just like the normal classroom ideas of going to a class that, that you would recommend the student, uh, do to get the most out of a seminar? Yeah. Um, that's actually a harder question for me, even though <laughs> I, I take, I, I take some, I take classes too. I, you know, I, I just took, uh, last year we had Henry Aikens out to my school and he, he gave a great seminar. Um, and then of course we had Hickson out before. So I, I enjoy being a student just as much. Well, my advice, I guess, as far as being a student is the same, um, whether it's a seminar or a regular class and generally is when you're watching the instructor teach, can you pick out what's fundamental about what it is they're teaching? What is the core principle that makes what they're doing work? And if you can pick that out, can you see where that core principle plugs in to jujitsu, the big picture of jujitsu as a whole? And if you can, if you can find that and you can figure out where that principle fits everywhere else in jujitsu, then you can get so much out of that, even just a few minutes of somebody showing something. And if you can't, then really what it becomes is just um, more lines on a, you know, a phylogenetic tree where you're just filling out this, like this guy does this, and this per- then I do this, and then this person does this, and it just becomes this long counter for counter, branch for branch chain of movement. Um, but, but the process of trying to find the fundamentals in what the coach is showing is I, I would, um, an analogy I would give for that would be panning for gold. You know, you just got to sit there and pan for that gold. And when you find it, then it's really, really valuable. And some coaches, uh, Henry definitely does this. Uh, Hickson does this. And some coaches, um, are really good about articulating the core principle behind what they're doing. And that's super helpful. Um, and those are always great coaches, but not every black belt, every coach does that. A lot of times they they will just teach techniques and chains of techniques. And then it's up to the students to try and see the principle, the guiding principles and mechanics behind what, what it is that coach is doing, but that's okay. You know, that's just one more challenge for you as a student. And if you can do that and kind of think about that while they're teaching, I think that you'll learn jujitsu faster. Okay, to get an idea of what you're 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 advocating for as far as, far as core principles, let's just, let's just say Henry Aikens is teaching a seminar on arm bars from Mount, yeah. and you know, yeah. I've been I've been training for I don't know seventeen years or so. I guarantee you, you know, I, I'm comfortable doing arm bars from Mount, obviously, but I guarantee you, I would learn something from that seminar, even. Like I know I'm going to learn some cool stuff. 100%. So, but, but what are some of these uh, like core principles that I would be able to to learn from? Uh, like as an example from Umbra from Mount, what would what would be an example from that? Sure. So it doesn't matter the position, um, and I, I think I've talked about this before on your show. But it, for me, the analogy I always use is that of a tree, and it's base, posture, connection, pressure. So base is the roots of the tree. Posture is the trunk of the tree. Posture is is your um, your body in relationship to the other person's body, how it's physically structured, you know, with the structure of your body in relationship to the other person's body. And base and posture are, are two sides of the same coin. They go together. Um, but that's the first thing is the base and posture um, that the person demonstrating the movement is operating from and what makes that base and posture effective. And then next is connection. And, of course, this is one of the things uh, 
Henry in, in particular focuses on and Hickson focuses on that kind of comes from his lineage, but understanding that piece where the base and posture connects with the other person in such a way that makes that movement, whatever it is, in this case, an arm bar from mount more efficient than it might otherwise be. And once you have base posture and connection, then everything after that's just a question of pressure and pressure um, force. And that's usually just about angles and weight. And what angle is he attacking it at, uh, from and, and how is he using his weight? How is he transferring his base to or from the other person, from the other person's posture? And if you look at jujitsu that way, jujitsu becomes much simpler and you can, um, you can really understand why it works or, or how to uh, also on another level, how to, how to make it more efficient for yourself, as opposed to just looking at it from uh, mechanically or even from a position to p- position point of view, because once you understand the base posture connection and the pressure angles of weight, then those things that you're going to learn from mount top when you're doing the arm bar will also translate from guard bottom and also translate cross sides and, and they'll permeate your game in a much bigger way. So as, as they're teaching this technique, in this example, Henry Aikens is teaching technique, I'm thinking, okay, where, where is the connection here? Uh, what is happening mm-hmm. to my posture? What's happening to his posture? That sort of thing. And you're kind of plugging uh, in what you're seeing to this equation. Yeah. The, so when I I would watch him teach an armbar from mount or anyone else, and I said, where, "Where's his base and where, what is he doing with his posture? How's it? Where's his tailbone? Uh, where's his spine? Where's his shoulders in, in relation to the other person's shoulders? Where is his weight right now? And understand that part of it. And then how is he connecting? Once you get the base and posture part down of, of what he's doing, how is he connecting to the other person, to the other person's body, um, in such a way to make it efficient? And then after that. Once you have that part, now you're actually talking about the, the movement as it, as it's going, the flow of it, and that's again angles and weight. So, um, and those are the things that I would I would look at when when you teach a technique to kind of flip this over. Mm-hmm. Are you using those words a lot? Like, hey guys, look at my base where it's at, and then you show a little bit more and say, okay, everybody, look at the Constantly. pressure. Okay, and so those are just just if you could. That's always that's where I start. Okay, so like as basically yeah. anybody teaching something, and you know, obviously in jujitsu we learn a lot from each other. So you get two blue belts yeah. paired off together, and they'll be, hey, my armbar sucks. Why? How can I clean this up? Uh, just kind of run through those things, or or maybe highlight a couple of actually your your posture is not very good when you try this, or maybe you know your base is is off, something like that. Those yeah. are good things to kind of evaluate to see what might be wrong or what could be improved upon. Hundred percent. That's cool. also you know you. To, to defend, to, to be able to defend anything, you can just reverse engineer that process. You know, how you can break that connection, how you can affect their base and posture. You know, if you think about, for example, an elbow knee escape, I mean, one of the one of the movements that probably every jiu-jitsu person that's listening to our podcast now is familiar with, a good elbow knee escape is really all about shifting the person on top's base. You know, if you can't shift their base, their weight from one leg to another, and they're bigger than you, and they know how to hold mount properly, Doing an elbow knee escape is super hard because, you know, they're heavy and it's hard to press their knees back and you're trying to shrimp back into their thigh and the back of their leg and it's super heavy. But once you learn how to shift their base to use your connection to affect their base and posture, then all of a sudden you can make them much lighter and you can execute the elbow knee escape. So whether you're talking about it from the top person or the bottom person's perspective, doing the movement or countering the movement, it always really comes back to base posture connection and pressure. Cool. That's I think that's a great learning tool anybody could could bring on the mats. And uh, absolutely, I, I I just put by the way, if anybody wanted to see, I think uh, within the last couple of weeks anyway, I put up a video on our YouTube channel, uh, the Straight Blast Gym YouTube channel, Straight Blast Gym International YouTube channel of that um, technique using that terminology to give people a better idea of of how to do that. Cool. Yeah, and we'll put a link to the YouTube channel. Uh, on the show notes, there's a lot of good information. It's, you know, you, you also have a, a podcast and, and you have uh, uh, kind of a split, but like you have some uh, audio stuff and then video stuff and it and kind of makes it like sometimes it's like, um, you know, audio version of this and, and, and that sort of thing. But really appreciate that that's out there. And I'll also put a link to, to your podcast as well. But uh, awesome. it's, the YouTube channel is a great, obviously a great 
learning tool for jujitsu as far as being able to see things. <laughs> and uh, that's yeah. something where podcasts, sometimes like this one, like kind of are lacking. We're not going to teach how to do the armbar from mount over this podcast. We right. might be able to give you a tip or maybe advice how to learn it better, but the actual details right. behind it is pretty tough. Absolutely. Uh, talking about that, like online learning, uh, you know, you, you do have the SBG University. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for the last 20 years, I, I've been traveling around the world um, teaching people from uh, at my black belt schools and, and other locations that are part of SBG and have a large body of students. But a lot of them, the majority of them, I would say, I may only see once or twice a year personally when I'm out there. And then it just kind of dawned on me about a year, year and a half ago, why don't I just put up uh, an online university so that they can, you know, watch what I'm doing and put my classes from Portland that I teach here weekly on that website. So that's what we do. Um, my weekly classes that I teach for my uh, Blue Belt and Above class are always go on onto um, SBG University every week. And so people can kind of see what I'm doing here in my home gym at SBG headquarters. And then we put all kinds of other stuff up on there too, questions and answers and classes and uh, footage from the camps that we have every year, uh, stuff from the other black belts. So anybody that's interested in that can go to SBG University and check it out. Um, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it because it allows me to connect more and um, pass on information in a way that, you know, otherwise required a, a plane, <laughs> a long trip. <laughs> yeah, and with, with uh, like 75 75- different locations that becomes very hard and you're you know obviously balancing uh this activity which i think you enjoy with family which you know you really need to spend time there as well so uh, using the benefits and the advantages of of uh like online training and and having a and your uh, you know sbg university has probably been in great for keeping you home a little bit more but also be able to probably reach a little further with what you're able to show uh, people who uh, want to learn from you yeah absolutely is it geared towards people who are you know, under the SPG umbrella or, you know, anybody could, could kind of go there and uh, uh, sign any, up and learn? Anybody's welcome. It's the same cost for everybody. Anybody that wants to is welcome. Um, I don't, it doesn't matter to me what school or where they're from. They're welcome to join. Uh, the, you know, the majority of the students on, on the uh, website are, are SPG students for sure. Cause I think those are most of the people who know who I am, but, Anybody's welcome to join it. Yeah, cool. That, that's a it's a great resource, and I'll uh, put a link to that as well on the show notes. You have a lot of cool stuff on, online, and uh, definitely appreciate that. Just it makes makes learning not, not necessarily just easier, but just more available as as far as getting good quality information. Yeah, for sure. We, we talked a little bit about uh, how important it is to have a good culture in the room, but what are some things you do to? Uh, have a handle on that and not just let it just be uh, the culture is based on who walks in the door and, and those people make up that culture, but, but be that it's actually cultivated and you have some sort of control and, and it's a culture that you're happy with. Good question. I think the first thing is that if you're an instructor or somebody who's running a gym, you have to know what your own values are and what, and really sit down and think about what it is that you want to pass on. Uh, sure, you can say, well, I want to teach jujitsu, but how do you want to teach jujitsu? Who do you want to teach jujitsu to? Um, what principles uh, are important to you as that goes? Really, what are, are the values that you want to pass along to the students or that you want to see um, spread throughout the community? And you have to really have a good handle on that yourself. So I think it's really important for for head coaches, especially and people who are running gyms, to think about that, to put some time and energy in and to come up with their own answers to those questions. And I think it's, like I said before, I think it's really important that it's their answers. It's not somebody else's answers. I mean, you can get ideas and see things. Of course, that's how we all learn. We all steal from each other and find things that other people are doing that you like, but it really does have to be an authentic reflection of, of who you are and what you want to be and see. Uh, Otherwise I don't think it works well. So once you have that, then you have to model it. Obviously, it's really important that it comes from the top down. And then you have to talk about it. You have to talk about it in your classes, during the mat chats, um, talk about it when people are coming in to join the gym, talk about it in the foundations classes when they first sign up and they, they go through an onboarding process. One of the things that they learn besides just the fundamentals of jiu-jitsu that we're trying to teach them is the mat etiquette 
and the values that we espouse and hold here at the at the gym in Portland. So that's more important in many ways than just the physical fundamentals of jujitsu. So they learn about our culture when they sign up. They learn about our culture in the foundation classes when they graduate and go into uh, the other classes with the other black belts. That those black belts are talking about those uh, values. Those black belts are modeling those values. And that's how it happens. And then it gets spread throughout the gym. And that's great. It's great for your school. I think it's the single most important thing you do as a gym owner. Um, And it also um, tends to lead to better financial success as well, because you're going to be creating a healthy atmosphere. People are going to want to stick around. Yeah, so the I, I guess the the culture is driven by uh, the basic values that are set up by uh, the the coach or the person running the gym, like as a yes. overall. Okay, so it, to give you one example, one one thing I talk about a lot is it's really important to create a place where people feel okay being vulnerable, right? Because the process of learning jujitsu involves you putting yourself in vulnerable positions, putting yourself in a position where somebody else could choke you or could put on an arm lock. And you, you have to be able to be comfortable constantly going back to those positions so you can eventually get better at jujitsu. Hickson talks about this all the time, putting yourself in bad places and being able to, to learn from there. But if you have a school where tapping is a big deal, where when someone taps someone else, they talk about it and brag about it and it becomes important. People are going to be less likely, not more likely to want to go into vulnerable positions and jujitsu. Everybody will learn jujitsu at a slower pace. Um, There's going to be a lot of people who are going to be turned off by that culture and not want to be part of it. And it's just not going to be healthy and people aren't going to mature as human beings as well as they could if instead you have a culture where not only is tapping not a big deal, but everybody on the mat understands, hey, that's awesome. Now you have an opportunity to learn something. And and that comes from the black belts down, the black belts being willing to roll with the students and, and being fine with tapping if one of the students catches them and being fine doing it in front of the class and, and, and explaining over and over again how important that process is. So the main, the most important thing for for me is when someone comes into my gym in Portland that they feel really comfortable and then when they're sitting on the mat, they're not concerned at all about tapping and they're certainly not concerned in the slightest that they'll get hurt by anybody. And, and th- so that the atmosphere is a lot healthier in that sense. And that allows me to teach jujitsu to the people who need it most. And it allows my athletes to get better at a faster pace than they otherwise would if they had a kind of immature overly competitive attitude about tapping out. That, that's, that, that's, uh, that's a great way to talk about culture and, and, and developing that type of environment. And we get all picture, uh, you know, the, the place where, you, you know, I get tapped out and that person is talking about for the next two weeks, you know, yeah. it, maybe next time it's, you know, we've rolled several rounds. I'm getting kind of tired. Uh, you may want to roll more rounds. Uh, maybe not. You know, I got, I'm tired of that two weeks is still going on. I'll probably get tapped. I'm pretty tired versus you get tapped out and, and it's, you know, not a big deal. It's not some celebrated accomplishment. Uh, and that sort of thing. This just puts you in a hypothetical situation and see how you would like address a culture that doesn't have this. If you have a, a black belt, you know, fairly new black belt and they, they move to a different city and, and they want to train somewhere and, and they, I guess kind of uh, get into a, a club, you know, a dozen or so people where Jiu Jitsu is very competitive. They're all like, you know, beating the crap out of each other. And, and, and they, and that culture needs to, in this, you know, to change and to become more of a learning environment. What are some things that that person can do? Uh, and you kind of hinted at a, at a couple of things as far as, you know, talk about, you know, it's okay to tap out and that sort of thing, but, but how would you uh, try to change that room to, to make it a more, uh, friendly and, and, and safe or, or learning environment? Yeah. So it, like I said, it always has to come from the top down. So the, the person that's ultimately responsible for that culture is whoever the head coach is. And they have either caused that to happen to begin with, or they've allowed it to happen by allowing other people who are on the mat teaching for them to do it. So in either case, they're the ones that are responsible for it, and that's where you would have to start. You have to start from the top down, take 
personal responsibility for that culture and then change it. So you can't, I can't take seriously black belts complaining about students in the gym who are overly competitive if that black belt himself or herself is overly competitive, right? Yeah. So, so it's all about coming from the top down. In your hypothetical, uh, a black belt visiting another school or moving somewhere and he's joining a culture that's already established like that, um, the last thing that he or she should want to do is then model that, then fall in line with that behavior. So what do you do? You, you tap, right? So, so you, you do jujitsu at your pace. And if the other pick, person picks up the pace, you keep doing jujitsu at your pace. And if you can still beat them, that's awesome because that means your jujitsu is, you know, very, very good. And that'll, that'll send a message. So everybody will look and go, wow, he, he still, or she still won, but they didn't have to turn it up. Right. They just kept going. They, they stayed relaxed. They didn't get an angry expression and they still won. That sends a big message. Um, if you're rolling and the other person turns it way up and, and you keep the same pace and they catch you, you tap, you smile, touch hands with them and do it again. And if they catch you again, you tap and then you keep going. And then what will happen ultimately is the person who's more relaxed, probably over the long run, will eventually get to a position where they'll be able to beat that person. Because usually that that's the best, fastest way to get your jujitsu good is to develop that kind of relaxed attitude. And then you can find technical solutions to that problem. And then that will be a huge lesson for everybody else. But even if that doesn't happen, even if that other person, for whatever reason, that's overly competitive, still winds up being the person that gets the tap on the mat, the mature people that are on the mat and the, the more immature but highly intelligent people who are on the mat are going to recognize what's going on. And they're going to realize that there's nothing really cool about the person's behavior if they're if they're behaving overly aggressive and then put a big make a big show of tapping someone out, it will cease being cool, and it'll see that it's not really affecting the other person. The other person still has a great attitude, and between the two of them, I know I would and the students will be too. Yeah, man, I'd much rather roll with the more relaxed guy, and train with the more relaxed guy, and that will send a message on the mat. So either way, staying relaxed and and playing at your own pace is going to be the high road and the high road is always the road to take. Having said that, I don't want to be a hypocrite because having said that, I know how hard that is to do when you're rolling, especially when it's somebody that just all of a sudden turns it up and you don't want to tap to that person. And I am myself, my own worst enemy at taking that advice and have on, you know, be more than likely to probably turn, turn up the pace. But the black belts that I really admire and that I look to do not. And that's where I'm trying to go with my jujitsu. And, um, and so that would be my advice for everybody. When is it uh, a good time to just, in, instead of uh, do jujitsu a little differently, you know, be relaxed and that sort of thing, to just talk about it or, or to just like, hey, man, I didn't know we were ADCC right now, like going a little fast yeah, exactly. versus doing. Yeah, exactly. Well, one thing we used to do in my gym, or I, I did this back in, the, especially in the, when I was first teaching, is when somebody came in, we were always training way too hard. But even as hard as we trained, you'd have somebody that came in and it was just complete psycho, right? They, as hard as we were training, they had to go super hard in a way that was almost dangerous for us to have noticed. But they were, you'd have guys that would do that. And when somebody came in like that, my way of dealing with it was to lay a beat on them, you know, lay a beat down on them. And I realized over the years that those guys don't tend to get that message. Not only do they not get a message, sometimes they like that. They like rolling that way. And then what happens? So you, you turn up the pace, you go even harder and rougher, you tap them out, or you, you knee ride them for five minutes until they're in agony and make them tap. Um, and then what message do they really get? I mean, you're kind of reinforcing the negative behavior most of the time, especially with guys like that, they're, they're not going to get the big picture. They're just going to, the bad behavior is going to, that, that they started with is just reinforced. So a more productive way to handle that situation is exactly what you just said is you just stop and write out immediately, not, not a day later or, you know, a week later, but right then and there, have a conversation with them about it. Like, you know, dude, I'm just warming up and you're, why are you going this hard? You know, let's just relax and have have, a, have an enjoyable roll. I mean, if you want to go that hard, that's fine. But I don't want to roll that way right now. That kind of conversation could be really productive, especially if it occurs right away, right after the event. 
Um, and then hopefully, you know, over time, the person starts to get it. But, but this is why we use the word culture and why we, we were talking about how important culture is in a gym. And it, and it really is the most important thing, because if, if you start the gym that way and you have the values like that, you're still going to have situations like this that arise. We certainly do. You know, every once in a while we'll have a student who's, who's rolling that way. Um, but it's not, it's, the rest of the culture isn't that way. And so nobody looks on it as cool. And instead that person kind of becomes by virtue of their own behavior, a bit of an outcast in a way, like people are less likely to roll with them. Nobody's given them positive feedback about the, what they're doing. And so the culture itself just kind of reinforces the values and it becomes less and less and less necessary to have those kind of conversations because oftentimes people will figure it out. They're like, wow, nobody else rolls you that way. Nobody else thinks I'm cool for doing that. Um, they'll stop doing it. Yeah. That's, <laughs> it reminds me of a situation I've, I've been working with for a while. Uh, we had a, a guy uh, come in to a kind of open mat scenario and large fit person. Uh, and just finally, the first time I met this person, I rolled with him and he fairly skilled, very athletic and he, and also super competitive. And it was, it was a tough, you know, we, we don't didn't use a timer, but it was a really rough 15 minutes or so. And I said, I'm, Hey man, I'm at the break. And I told him right there that first day I met him, like, it's going to be hard for you to find people that want to roll with you if you roll like aggressively all the time. And he had, and I would keep telling him this and telling this, and it was just like it didn't click. And then eventually, you know, he's several weeks or, or months have passed. I said, Hey, I'll roll with you, but I'd like you to play guard or something because I'm not going to last very long uh, if you want to just beat me up. And, and so he played guard. And, and, and that kind of maybe clicked a little bit for him that he didn't have to try to win and he doesn't have to, you know, use all, everything he's got every time. And, and finally people are kind of incorporated him into the, into their, to their rolling sessions as far as uh, that go. But I didn't have the option to smash him, but I don't think that's usually a good option because like you say, sometimes they don't even understand, you know, why am I getting smashed? Or sometimes they actually like that, you know, hey, this is a good one. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> using I, words is, is really, really useful. I think that sometimes it's hard though, because it does take a little bit of that ego check, you know, ask somebody, Hey, slow down a little bit. It's almost saying right now, this is more than I want to deal with. Uh, it might feel yeah. like that to you. And that's sometimes it's hard to do. It's super hard. I think for me, it's super hard. I'll be honest about it. You know, I am the, I like to try, I always kind of roll somewhat competitively. I never really turn it up that much. And I, and I'm, I don't usually turn it down that much unless of course somebody asked me in advance. I, I, I don't, I don't mind rolling hard. I don't like rolling rough, but I don't mind rolling hard. Uh, but I am I'm trying and kind of forced now to 50 to roll lighter. And I, and I realized over the last couple of years, how important that is. And some of my own black belts are so much better at this than I am. Like I've mentioned before, but John Diggins, who's one of my head of my jujitsu competition team is a much better role model for this than, than I am. But I am trying to, to do this because I realize it's, it's the best way to learn jujitsu. And it's also the culture I want to model, but it's very hard when you get somebody, especially if it's somebody who's, you know, annoyed you to begin with because they are going, you know, overly rough, then the last thing I want to do is stay relaxed. Usually, you know, I want to flip them over and smash them a little bit. So I have to fight my own worst instincts on that one for sure. It's almost easier to address it when you see it happening to someone else. And that, that's been a problem with me as a coach is if we're rolling five rounds, I'm rolling five rounds and to sit out around and watch people roll. I sometimes I'm surprised. Like that guy's kind of a jerk. I don't have any trouble with him, and I don't yeah. notice it. But he's smashing this this other person crazy. And and so as a coach uh, or somebody just observing, you know, like hey, you know, slow it down a little bit or let that person work. Just saying that is is something that that other person might never say. But hearing that from somebody who's standing off to the side, uh, observing the role, it comes with a different set of authority and uh, it might sit a little bit better and definitely easier to deliver. You know, it's easy as, a, as somebody who's outside, hey, slow down a little bit. You're going a little too fast or maybe a little too rough or let the other person work a little bit. We're training here. I think that's an easy way to Absolutely. kind of get around that. That's a much better way to do it. And one, one thing that's super important there about what you said is I don't, I, 
tell the coaches this, but during our open mats and our, and our you know, competition team, whoever's running the competition team practice, and which is essentially isolation sparring and, and rolling, um, should not be participating. You know, there always has to be one responsible body that's just watching the entire match so that you can keep an eye on, on that kind of stuff. Not just general safety of making sure people don't run into each other, but, you know, keep an eye that that, that that's not happening, like you said. And you can't do that when you're participating and, and rolling yourself. So there always should be somebody that's standing up, that oh, a mature coach who's standing up and keeping an eye on that mat. Man, that, that, I've never thought of it that way but it's actual like a it's a role it's a position it's the same as like what do you what do you need you need a timer you need good mats exactly. you probably need a drink of water you need a person who's going to kind of oversee this thing and make sure that um you know nothing negative is is going on 100 percent. yeah it's super important that's cool i i yeah i never really thought of that but it, it really uh makes sense when you go uh to like an open mat or uh you know j- just one of those training style of days um, you know, besides that type of a thing, you have somebody who's kind of in charge of it all. What else would we expect to see? What am I, Matt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah, I guess that wasn't a very uh, well worded question, but yeah, how do you guys hold those sort of uh, open mat type of classes? Yeah, so my I run competition team practices here at my gym, and and as uh, as well as uh, John Diggins, so I mentioned before, runs the other jiu-jitsu competition team, and then one of my black belts, Rick Davison. Uh, is the head coach for my MMA team. But I, I teach uh, one night a week. I do one competition team practice. That particular um, hour is mostly isolation sparring. So I would, my basic rule for myself is, and I think, I don't know if they figured it out or not, but I think most of them have, but I want them to do twice as much isolation sparring as they do rolling. By which I mean, and I like long rounds uh, when we do isolation sparring. So I'll usually set the timer for five minutes and it's one side mount bottom try and escape one side mount top hold an attack if they escape stop start again same person on top and they'll do that for five minutes and then we switch and then they do that for five minutes and then i might let them roll for five or six minutes and then we go back okay and close guard one side stand it open one side try not to let them stand it open five minutes and then switch five minutes and then i'll let them roll so they're getting twice as much positional sparring as they are roll time and sometimes with the positional sparring, I'm even more specific where I'll go uh, one side, hold mount, one side escape, but you're only allowed to escape with an upa. That would be a real common one that I would do. So that's how I like to run my competition team practices. And I'll put them in the positions where I think everybody, the, the ones that are most important and also the ones where I think people need the most work. Sometimes I'll, even during the rolls, I'll, I'll make it more specific if we're working on, for example, defending leg locks where, where one side's only allowed to win with a straight foot lock. So the entire time during that match, you know that person's hunting for that. you got to kind of keep an eye out. So that's how I like to run the competition team practices myself. Um, I like the longer rounds because if you do, if you're only doing like two minutes or three minutes on bottom or top or, w- or worse, less, like 90 seconds, which I think is a waste of time, You don't ever really get to, uh, oftentimes, if you're getting shut down, if you're having trouble escaping or you're having trouble holding, and those are the rounds that matter, that's where you're going to learn. Your body doesn't really get a chance to figure out how to stop it, you know, or how how to succeed. It takes two, sometimes three minutes, four minutes, and then you realize as the person, A, the person starts to get a little more tired, but you also realize when I do this, they do that, so here's an opening for me. And then... By the end of the round, at the towards the fifth minute, you can start to escape, right? Or you can, or you can shut their escapes down, and that was the learning moment that was important. That was what the whole. That's what you got out of that. That's what it's about. And if you make the round too short, I think sometimes it's hard for people to discover that or to uh, to get to that learning moment. And so I like the longer isolation sparring rounds. It's interesting how you say, you know, okay, this is side control, and then for five minutes, switch side control for five minutes, and then roll, and then and then after mm-hmm. that, we're going to do, you know, I don't know, guard, and then sw- you know, mm-hmm. um, so it's not side control for five minutes, five minutes, and then mount for five minutes, five minutes, and then roll at the very end. You mix the rolling in uh, in that. Is there a reason for that? No, you know, sometimes I will do, I've, I've done it the other way too. I don't have a real specific reason. Sometimes I'll have them do some isolation sparring and then I'll have them roll at the end. Um, and I'll have them rotate partners quite a bit. 
Well, I guess the, the main thing is I know when people come into the competition team practices, one of the reasons they're there is they want to have, they want to get some matches in. Okay. So they're there to practice for competition teams. So I don't want to um, have them go through, uh, exert almost all of their attributes just doing the isolation sparring. So I want to give them a chance to also have some roles while they're fresh. More importantly, I want to give them a chance to have some roles against someone else who's still fresh. So that's why I want to, uh, you know, I'll let them do one roll after a round of isolation okay. sparring. So if I, if I, if I'm going and you know, after 40 minutes of this, I'm done. I, uh, I got to roll a couple of times at least. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that, that makes sense. Well, see the, it's awesome. If I could get it to where you're doing isolation rounds for 40 minutes, you're done. You feel like you're super exhausted and then have you roll. That's perfect. But the problem with that is your training partner will also be exhausted. Like in my perfect environment, I'd have you do 40 minutes of isolation rounds. You'd be exhausted, and then I'd bring in some fresh bodies for you to compete against. But since everybody's training together, um, I, I try and intermix the rolling so they're also – in other words, I think it's great for you to train when you're tired. That, that's good for your jiu-jitsu, but – you want to, it's not necessarily great for you to be training against other people who are also exhausted because you're not going to get that same feel that you get when you first touch hands or, uh, you know, have a match at, at the tournament, right? And the other person's fresh. So you got to feel what it feels like against uh, a body that's not tired. Do you, do you give any guidance as far as, let's just use that side control uh, example again. Uh, me and you paired up for five minutes. You start on side control and me. I don't escape ever. The whole five minutes of me just struggling and trying to work and I can't do anything. Yeah. Is that, yeah. is that too much? Like how many escapes should I be accomplishing in that five minutes? Yeah, it's generally too much. So for regular practice, what I would say and during the classes, the regular classes in the gym, during my seminars, I would say that you were being a good training partner if you were shutting that person down the whole time. So the word that we use is adaptive resistance and the adaptive means it can go up or it can go down. If you're, if that person's having too easy a time escaping, then I want you to turn it up. And that, per, if you completely shut that person down, even after several minutes, they can't figure out a solution. Then I would probably want you to turn it down a little bit, or, or more likely, I would, I would want you to take more risks. I would say, hey, why don't you be more aggressive about going for submissions so that you create some openings rather than just camping out on top of them. That way, you're both learning something. In competition team practice, that specific class. I might allow you to do that um, or even want you to do that because I really want that person to, um, to be able to problem solve, to be able to find uh, hopefully eventually a solution. And it may not occur till the four, four rounds, four minutes, 30 seconds to escaping your cross side game. But even there, because I, I want both of you to learn, I'd be wanting you to learn as well. I'd probably be saying to you, if you're the one on top, why don't you attack more? Open it up, right? Because I want both of you to, to get the most of that, that experience. And, and once you've camped out on top of somebody and you realize they can't go anywhere, what are you really learning after that, right? So if it's a competitive match and you just want to figure out um, what mistakes they're going to make that are eventually going to give you a submission, that's okay. Then you can camp out on them for nine minutes and, until they're exhausted and eventually get a submission. But competition team practice, I've got an hour. You've got an hour. How many of these hours a week do you have? And then you have your tournament. Let's get the most out of that hour as we can. And so I'd probably tell you, I'd want you to open, open up your game more, take more risks. Why not start going for arm bars, start going for, uh, um, you know, a paper cutter joke, start attacking in some way, maybe transition to knee rider mount, things like that. That would be uh, probably what I would ask you to do while I was watching that happen. That, that's a it's a cool way to, to kind of frame it. Uh, it's <laughs> it's it's one thing to to be worried about you know developing your jujitsu for your competition, but it, you know you also need to be that that teammate and uh, be yeah. a good training partner. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. We have we've talked about quite a few things from you know coaching and running a, a, a big organization to uh, you know different drilling methods and lots of stuff in between. Anything else uh, like <laughs> on your uh, on your mind that you want to talk about? Uh, I- 
No, I, I appreciate you having me on. It's always a, it's always a pleasure to to talk to you. And um, I would just uh, ask our listeners if they like the the stuff I've been saying or s- some of the material to check out our YouTube page and make sure they subscribe. We're trying to build that up a little bit, and uh, I'm trying to. I'm, I've been doing a new uh, section where I'm just doing question and answers from our subscribers, so people can actually go on YouTube and ask me questions on there, and, and I will post the video up there for them. And, uh, and if they really like what we do and they're interested in my classes, um, they can always join SBG University and they can be a, pretty much a weekly student. They can, they can uh, take my class online every week that I have here in Portland with my uh, advanced students. That is great. You're uploading stuff to the SBG University website every week. Guys, I urge you guys to check that out. Uh, check out the YouTube channel as well. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for jumping on here with me again. Thanks for having me again. Um, I appreciate it, and uh, I look forward to talking to everybody. And, and anybody that's, that uh, is interested or has more questions, uh, I'd also encourage people to feel free to reach out and shoot me an email. I always enjoy hearing from people. It was great having Matt Thornton back on the show. I really appreciate him uh, sharing his time. And you guys, I, uh, I I've, I've I've talked about it a little bit as far as the value of watching students grapple. But I routinely don't do that. I, if, if people are rolling, I'm usually one of the people who's rolling. And I, I get in the habit of not wanting to sit out around and, and observe. And just hearing that, you know, he's, he's recommending basically, if you have open mat, somebody should be watching and kind of running that and, and, and setting that tone and, and making sure everybody's okay. Uh, that's, that's a really good idea that you have kind of a, a person in charge of the open mat who is not actually rolling because as a coach, even if you're rolling with a fairly, you know, unskilled person, you're able to kind of keep an eye on things or that sort of a situation. You can't watch the same and you can't talk to people the same as if you're standing around watching and, and observing and, and helping people and keeping everybody safe. I thought that was a really neat concept. I'd never, I think in 306 episodes, I could be wrong because I do have a, not the greatest memory, but I don't think anybody has, has said anything quite like that as far as having that as, as a kind of a position. And uh, man, great insight. So if you uh, think this episode, this interview would be a uh, value to somebody you know, uh, send it to them or recommend episode 306 to some some friends. And we really appreciate that. And uh, hopefully it will help them out. And, and uh, I, I learned a lot. And hopefully your friends can too. Yeah, and also too, uh, if you happen to be traveling through Wichita, uh, or you happen to be have, traveling down south uh, through uh, the Houston area, you know, get a hold of Joe, get a hold of Byron and I in Wichita. We'd love to train with you. We just had a uh, listener come by and train, and uh, you know, I live to tell about it. Uh, so thank you, uh, Rich Holt, for uh, stopping by. Uh, trained three days with us, so uh, great time. Yeah, uh, you don't have to all be like. Six foot seven, <laughs> 230, <laughs> 40 pounds. Yeah, and throw me around guys? for the entire time. Go to Gary. Oh, I was going to say, can we get normal sized guys come and visit us? <laughs> no, just kidding. We had a great time. And I always joke with another one of our listeners. I know Joe does too. Uh, Brian Barkey, he actually sent me a message this morning, said he's going to find a way to get out here and train. And Yikes. I told him, told him I was going to fake injury. And, uh, he <laughs> yeah. said, don't worry, we'll, we can find a way to train around it. So uh, <laughs> yeah, looking forward to that. So I hope you're listening, Brian, and, and I hope you're listening too, Rich. Uh, but thanks for stopping by. We had a great time training with you. Yeah, it, we, I did have a blast uh, getting to know you, Rich, and, and spending some time and you know time on and off the mat. We got to meet Gary for lunch. That was great. Can't always do uh, everything, but uh, you know, definitely, you know, if you're in town, we do want to get some mat time with you. Send us a message, and we'll see if our schedules line up. And if our schedules line up for a little bit of extra stuff, we'll make that happen too. And. Uh, it's always a good time. You kind of, it's good to to kind of just talk to some audience members and and see what they th- feel about the show and get some insight. Just kind of one on one setting. So thank you, Rich, for sharing that with us. You know, speaking of friends, uh, there's a myth that I've heard before that uh, you'll be friends with everyone in your gym. It'd be like one big happy family and everybody gets along. You think that's true, Gary? Definitely not a chance. I mean. I train with Byron, and, uh, you know, look how that goes. We don't get along that well, but no, um, that basically brings us to the article of the week. Um, this week's article, it's uh, from BJJ for Women. Uh, biggest Would you- thank, you, Gar- thank you, Gary, for turning us on to this article. It's a site I know you follow, so go ahead. 
Yeah, you know, I'm. Uh, I, I, it's just great, uh, great site. I know you're trying to put it down, Joe. But uh, yeah, Joe, I really like, <laughs> no, not, not the site, Gary, not the site. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, really, check out this site. It, it's got a lot of great things on it. But this one's from uh, February or February 16, 2019. Biggest jujitsu miss, and uh, basically, they're giving us a miss. Uh, what do you think? Are they miss or they will? Are they truth? And Joe, you said the first one. You'll be friends with everyone in your gym, like a big happy family. And I would say no. Um, you know, un- unless your gym is maybe two or three people and they're your best friends. Um, but even hey, uh, a family always has squabbles and always has spats, uh, unless it's the Cleaver family. But most families do have squabble spats. But a big gym, you're, there's always going to be people that uh, you may not be best friends with, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, I mean, look at uh, work. I mean, me, Joe, and Byron work for BJJ Brick, and uh, you know, we're definitely not best friends. I mean. I don't even think I even like Byron at all, but it's going to happen. So uh, I don't think that ye, ye, everybody is going to have a big, happy family gym. I mean, I would agree. That is a myth. Yeah, I don't. It's, and that's OK. Not everybody uh, likes the same things. Yeah. We, we all well, need that, to be civil and get along. I mean, that's a, that's an important thing. Yeah. We don't want people who are like. Uh, consider like this person's kind of a cancer on the gym. We don't need that sort of thing in the environment. We don't all need to be watching the same TV shows and and you know like laugh at the same jokes. I don't know. Uh, there's lots of room for different personalities in the gym, and and, uh, and that's perfectly fine. Yeah, we're here you know, for the betterment of the gym. You know, so you're not going to like everybody, but you know we we all have to make each other better. All you know help. Uh, we don't have to all go out and eat barbecue afterwards, but um, let's uh, be civil, as Byron said. Yeah, I think that's one of the beauties of jujitsu is that uh, uh, you you go to the gym and you've all got a common purpose. And I train with people that I have nothing in common with, and I don't train with anybody that there's animosity between us. But some people were just not friends when I have anything in common. But I roll with them the same way I roll with people that. I'm good friends with at the gym. You go there and you train with doctors and lawyers and welders and nurses. And I mean, you name it, everybody, every type of person. And uh, so you don't have to like them to have a good class. Yeah. Another, another thing they have on here is, is a possible myth is that you must roll with everyone. Oh, and I would change that to anyone. <laughs> yeah, if there's, if there's 20 students, clearly you can't roll with everyone every night. But uh, if somebody asks you to roll, it's okay to say, you know, no, thank you. you. You might need to find a few ways to, to politely decline uh, as far as, as, as that goes. But there's no requirement that you roll uh, with people. If you find yourself not wanting to roll with your coach or the instructor, uh, that might be an issue. It's like, is this the right gym for you? Maybe uh, if, if that role is considered one of your least favorite roles, maybe you're in the wrong place. Uh, and that might go more towards your instructor than you. As far as quality of role, I, I've, I've asked several white belts, like, hey, hey you want to get around and you want to roll? And sometimes they say no, which I don't give them any trouble. You know, that's, that's fine. You know, um, be that way. <laughs> no, it, I don't make a big deal of it. That's, that's cool. Let me know when you want to roll. I'll be happy to roll with you. I, I think sometimes they don't want to roll with an upper belt. And, and they really they don't have any idea what they're doing. <laughs> like, uh, I will be one of the easiest roles you have. If, if you want to go roll with other white belts or maybe some blue belts, those might be tough roles. But me grabbing a new person and rolling with them, I guarantee you it's not going to be a, a, a brutal role. Uh, you're going you're gonna to enjoy it. Hopefully you'll learn a little bit of something. Hopefully I, I'll have a fun time too. Uh, you know, a lot of it is just me. I enjoy meeting people and getting to know people. So uh, I'll probably talk a little bit while we roll or chat. Uh, but you know, is this going to be uh, you know black belt versus white belt crazy jujitsu? You're getting thrown, you're getting choked and armbarred. My throws aren't that good, so that's not going to happen. But uh, it's just they're just not understanding what's going on. So you, you might give people a chance, or if you've heard like this guy's, he's a bruiser. He's gonna he always injures everybody. You know, maybe you never roll with that person. You're a free person. <laughs> you, you shouldn't be getting pushed into do things you don't want to do. Uh, and and you're and you're paying for this service. You're training jujitsu, but uh, you know you have a little bit of nervousness about somebody. It it's it uh, you know maybe you go with your gut feeling on that and you decline a role. 
but uh, you know, it's also good to ask. You know, ask who's is this guy that rough? He looks like he's crazy. Maybe people see me rolling real hard with somebody else. I'm like I'm not doing that. I don't roll the same with anybody. Like I, I always adjust my uh, level of intensity based on who I'm training with. And uh, if they would just ask a, a fellow teammate, is 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 Byron gonna uh, be be re rough on me or injure my ribs or whatever? Unlikely. Uh, definitely not on purpose as far as any injuries go. So I don't know. You feel free to decline anybody to roll. You have no requirement. This isn't uh, Fight Club. <laughs> yep. So I hope you were listening to that one, uh, Brian Berkey. Um, <laughs> we can decline. <laughs> Thank you for showing up. Let's do some push-ups today, and we're going to do some jazzercise later on. If anybody doesn't know, Brian's the greatest guy in the world, but he's also like a big-time power lifter, and uh, some of these numbers he uh he can lift is is insane, and I always joke with him that uh, I I don't want to roll with him, but I'll definitely roll with him. But um, everybody will be great at jujitsu. Uh, this is one I like, and uh, you know, uh, like the uh, the author says, this is a struggle for for people to admit they are average or a slow learner. And I'll admit both. Uh, I am a very slow learner. I am average at jujitsu, but uh, you know, I have fun at it, and that's what counts. And you know, what she's talking about is. Uh, you know, don't have unrealistic goals. Um, you know, don't compare yourselves to other people. And, you know, some people are going to be world champions. Some are going to be like me, uh, just happy people who, who are, you know, enjoying a hobby and, uh, and competing and, and making friends and learning, but at, at my own pace. And, uh, it works great for me. And, you know, I try not to compare myself to people. I, I do sometimes when, especially when uh, somebody uh, just really smashes me. And, and when I say smash, I mean, it's just head or tails better than me. And uh, I'm like, boy, how did that person get so good? But, uh, you know, then I realized that, you know, I'm just an average grappler having fun. Um, so, so don't ever want anybody to just uh, really feel down on themselves, uh, comparing themselves to other people. So just uh, remember, everybody's not the same. I know you said that earlier today, Joe. Uh, we're all different people. Uh, and uh, like Joe said, some people have that tight top game. Some people have a loose top game. Some people like the bottom game. Uh, just like everybody will not be great at jujitsu. Yep, that's a good point. But uh, don't let that give you an excuse if you're feeling a little bit down. I've been through a few periods of my jujitsu where I thought this is good as I'm going to get. I'm going to keep doing jujitsu, but I know I'm not going to get any better. And then something always inevitably happens and I break through the plateau. So, yeah. uh, and I can, I can tell everybody listening too. Joe and I are both 52 years old and we didn't start when we were 16. I mean, we no. started well into our thirties and, uh, and so, I mean, no experience before. And, and I know I, I will say this, that I'm better. I get better all the time. And, and I know Joe will say the same thing. So I, I like what Joe said, don't let that you know, use as an excuse. We will get better. And I think uh, you talked about it earlier today, Joe, putting time in, you know, that time on the mat, uh, you know, just be there and uh, just showing up. One of the hardest things to do, but by showing up, you will get better. Yep. Everybody gets better, but not everybody gets better at the same pace. So I, I'm just going to end with one more. There's about a dozen of these, I think, but I like this one. Uh, you must take private lessons. And actually, I don't know if that's a myth. I've not really heard it before as a myth, but I hear a lot of opinions like that going around and sort of gently being pushed towards people like, you, you know, you have to compete if you want to get better or if you want to learn a certain type, so you got to go to the course, you go to this guy's gym or, or go uh, take a private or go, take, go to a seminar. And the reality is those things are, are all good. But you don't have to do anything extra if you don't want. Go to class a couple of days a week, work hard, and uh, uh, do a little study and, and get better at your own pace. And so, yeah, the, people will tell you you have to compete to get better. It's not necessarily true. It might be helpful for a lot of people, but uh, do jujitsu the way it works for you. Yeah, and there's a uh, private lessons are great if if you're taking them and you like them. Good if you haven't, you might look into trying them if you could afford them. But there's a little bit of a a secret <laughs> with private lessons. Uh, you could get small private lessons with a lot of your roles. So if if Joe and I are rolling, it's a good role. We're both working pretty hard, and 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 he just he slices through my half guard, 
and 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 then however the roll goes, that's fine. And at the, right at the end of the roll, I go, I go, what was it that you that you did right there when you passed my half guard? And he'll just he'll say, I did this because you made a mistake when you turned your hips the wrong way. Oh, okay. That was a little mini private lesson right to my game. Like, okay, I just learned every time somebody's passing my half guards, I tend to have a tendency to turn my hips the wrong way, and, and Joe cleaned it up for me. Private lesson to my game specifically. So if you get in the habit of just when something really surprises you or works well against you, your teammates should, uh, most of the time, depending on the personality, but most of them are, are more than willing to, to help you out and to let you know what just happened to you and and, uh, and maybe how it could be prevented or why it happened that way. Maybe they do it to everybody. But uh, just asking a question right after a roll could a lot of times just equivalent to private lessons, you know, for free, you know, little snippets here and there. That it's a it's a great way to, to learn about your game specifically. Not really a myth, but I do. Yeah, there's a great a lot of myths on here that they talk about and they kind of uh, uh, bat around a little bit and uh, like the article, like the website. Oh, there'll be a link to in the show notes. Uh, it talks a lot about BJJ for women. So uh, check it out. Good stuff. Keep up the good work, guys. Uh, have a question here. It's just one of our frequently asked questions. Uh, wanting to know, you know, just personally, do you guys wear mouth guards? Do you not wear mouth guards? And uh, do you see, see much use for them? You know, that's a great question right there. Um, I personally do not wear a mouth guard. I used to for many years. Um, I really don't know why I stopped wearing one, but I can tell you, I've put my teeth through my lips a couple times and, uh, it probably would have been better for me to be wearing my mouth guard. Um, you know, teeth are, teeth are important and expensive. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know why I quit wearing one. I used to wear it for all the, you know, for a long time. And, uh, for some reason I just stopped and I don't know why. Yeah. I, I don't wear one. I, I never really have. Um, I guess for the same reason I don't wear a cup. I just, I, I grappled for a while without any protection and didn't have any incidences. And now it's been quite a few years and I haven't lost any teeth. I haven't sustained any damage ever. So I'm, I'm just going to go with what I've been doing. Yeah. yeah and they can't, if, can't really fault that. I, I do wear a mouth guard. Uh, you do? I, I, yeah, I, I wear, it's just, it covers the top teeth and uh, I've basically worn a mouth guard. I can't think of a time where I didn't. You know the crazy thing is, I roll with you all the time and never really noticed. So the, the I mouth- guess it's I guess it's because you wear a yellow mouth guard. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it, it, I don't like the ones that cover both up and upper and bottom. I'm sure there's more protection there, and some of those have a hole in the middle, and it's like I can't quite close my lips around that. To where sometimes it's like. I've had those, and I'm like, I'm slobbering. This is not what you want to do while you grapple. And I do talk quite a bit. You know, I'm not. We're not typically going super hard in in, in competition mode while we're on the mat. So a, a little bit of talking, a little bit of, uh, I don't know, just complimenting somebody on a good sweep or something like that. I do quite a bit of that. So uh, I do like the ability to talk. So just the upper half uh, doesn't really limit my ability to talk. I'm used to it. it doesn't affect my breathing at all. And I don't know if it's saved me much or not, but uh, I'm used to it. And, uh, you know, I do think it's a little added safety measure because teeth are are rather expensive. And, and I don't really have – I have had a cracked tooth uh, doing a little bit of kickboxing uh, with, with Dave Goodman. <laughs> Gary, you know, that guy kicked me right in the tooth and cracked my tooth. Uh, not not the most fun experience. but uh, So you so – you... Byron, you weren't wearing a mouth guard for that? I have no idea. That was, that I was, was 15 say, yeah, years ago. Crazy. Not I, probably was. I probably was. Yeah. Uh, well, Dave kicks just... like a mule. Yeah, that wasn't fun. Maybe that's why I don't like the stand-up stuff so much. <laughs> anyway. Well, uh, I, I, I have worn them various times. You know, give them a try. Uh, and that kind you're talking about that goes with up and bomb to you, I don't know if I can get used to that. Yeah. So, you know, I've worn them both. Now, I've I've uh, trained before with guys doing MMA and done some light ground and pound with them. And if I was ever in that situation again and it was getting heated, I would definitely wear one. I have one. I just don't ever wear it. So if you uh, if you have any questions for us, send them to bjjbrick at gmail.com. 
be happy to uh, answer those and hopefully uh, share some stuff with everybody out there. Because if you have the question, likely other people have the same or similar question. I want to give a shout out to our newest Patreon supporter, James. Uh, thank you, James, for support on Patreon. What James has done is listen to the podcast, thought, wow, this is uh, something that I enjoy. I assume that's what happened. <laughs> and because of that, uh, James wants to support us and make sure that we're as stable as possible and, and producing the best quality content. So you go to Patreon, there's a link in the show notes, and you can pledge like a dollar per episode. Uh, we have some supporters that are pledging two or even three dollars per episode. That really means a lot to us. It helps us tremendously. And uh, what we do <laughs> is as a token of our appreciation, because we can't, obviously, if you get a dollar, we, we can't give you five bucks. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's a net loss. But we, as a token of appreciation, we'll send you out a five inch BJJ brick gi patch and a sticker just to say thank you so much for your support. And uh, we'll continue to do the best we can for you on the side of uh, making quality podcasts about jujitsu, mostly about jujitsu. Sometimes we talk about boats, sometimes we talk about Gary doing art. <laughs> Sometimes we talk about Byron's part-time jobs while he was in college. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he fell, fell a little bit short on that one, but he gave it his best. Effort is the is the main thing, and having that growth mindset. <laughs> <laughs> but the growth mindset did not work in that situation. <laughs> yeah, too late. I hit that spurt, and uh, you know. You guys are hammering me today. <laughs> oh, well. Hey, at least it, you guys are doing a pretty good job. I got to give you that. Good job, Joe. Oh, uh, man. I'm just following your lead, brother. Keep it going. <laughs> uh, not sure what we'll be doing next week since uh, technically as recording this, the episode uh, or, or the event, the BJ Break Camp, has already happened, but we haven't actually been to that. We might be able to record one at the camp. Not sure. Uh, so if, if we do, that'll be probably next week's episode. If we can't, we'll, we'll figure something else out. <laughs> we'll likely bring an episode next week. I don't, uh, it seems very likely, but not for sure what we'll be based around. It might be kind of a Q and a show. It might be, uh, with some people that were there it may not be, I don't know, but we'll see how it kind of pans out. We're going to, we're going to have to play it by ear gentlemen, but I'm sure we're going to have a great time. Or we had a great time. <laughs> yeah. We will have had a great time, and we will have a great time in the future. That's a positive mindset, Byron. Thanks, Gary. Not just positive, but I'm also a little sweaty. So stay sweaty, my friends. And you're not only sweaty, don't forget to shower. And uh, before you do all that, train hard, train smart, and get better. Guys, we'll see you on the mats. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs>